Welcome to Hope is Here. My name is Greg Horn. We've had guests on here that have really inspired me because they've overcome great obstacles and yet their faith has become stronger. Instead of becoming bitter, they've chosen to become better. And today we've got a real hero of the faith. Our guest today is April Ballantyne. That's with a B. Ballantyne, and she's going to be sharing her story with us uh, over the next uh, couple of programs. And April, first of all, thanks for being on uh, Hope is Here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, like a lot of people, we've all been in relationships, and maybe we stayed in them a little too long, but, you know, it's it's kind of better than being alone and kind of like maybe an old pair of shoes. It just gets kind of comfortable, but tell us about uh, back in 2013, uh, you were just kind of coming out of a, a five-year relationship, and share a little bit with us about that relationship. Sure. Um I, I guess it was 2008, you know, I met this gentleman. It seemed like we had a very good connection. Our, you know, communication was great. There were some things that um, he enjoyed doing that I enjoyed doing as well as far as sports and being really active. And it just seems like we hit it off. So for, you know, for three years, we continued on this journey and, you know, had, had a bunch of joys and not many lows, not many arguments. Uh, we traveled and got to see things that he'd never seen, and um, it was just, it was a great relationship, so I thought. Um, up until, I guess after that third year, I just realized there were um, different behaviors and different actions that I never clearly understood um, because I'd, I'd never experienced them before, and the only thing that I could see was that he loved me and wanted to spend time with me. But now looking into it, I see that it was more of a control mechanism um, of wanting me to be with him all the time or not wanting me to be around family, um, not wanting me to have any male friends. Um, It even got to the point to where he didn't want a male figure to speak to me first without speaking to him. And so we would go back and forth um, about this, and I still didn't recognize the control mechanism, I just argued the point that you could, you can't make me ignore my friends or you can't, you know, put me in a bubble and keep me there. And um, so the relationship started to struggle because I guess I'm kind of bullheaded and he is too. He was too. And um, so I continued to do things that frustrated him. So when he became frustrated, you know, he, we, we would argue, which we never did. And he would start calling me names that, um, that were very disrespectful. And so as we continued this relationship, it, it got rocky. It got very challenging. It was very difficult to, to continue. And I would get a promotion at work. And he said, well, if you get this promotion, then um, I won't have to pay for this or I can do this. Or if you have to travel for work, then I don't have to pay my part of the rent this month. And it was just weird, crazy things that didn't make any any sense whatsoever. And I continued to look at him through the side of my eye because uh, at this point, you know, I'm questioning my judgment. I'm questioning his um, not necessarily his potential, but but his, um, I guess, his reasoning for wanting to be in this relationship if we didn't get along. So I had I tried several times to end the relationship peacefully, but it just became worse because he got it in his head that his whole world was going to be over. And there was a situation to where I came home from work and I opened the door Next thing I knew, he had grabbed my arm, and I'm on the living room floor. And he's pacing the floor with his gun in his hand. And at this point, I'm like, okay, why is he playing games with the gun? And at this point, I, I never thought that he would actually, you know, use the gun. I didn't think there was anything in it. Um, I'd never experienced any type of abusive relationship. So he ended up leaving leaving to go to work because he worked nights, and that 
that day when he left, I grabbed a change of clothes, and I went to my mother's house, and I got in the bed with her, and she's like, are you okay? And I just told her, I was like, yeah, I just need to sleep. And she didn't know what was going on. She didn't know what had happened. Um, and I couldn't tell her, nor could I tell anyone else, because one, they'll just say, well, you need to get out of the relationship, and it's not that easy to end a relationship with someone that is an abuser. So I went back home. Things were fine for a while. And just erratic behavior continued. And I don't know what it was, but there was some type of substance abuse because I could see him changing throughout different times or I could see a different person. Um, and I can see him evolve into that person. So... There was another situation. I came home, and, you know, I was pretty careful. And I went in the house, and I left I left my keys in my purse, like, right at the... Actually, I left my purse at the front door, and I left my keys in my hand. Because I just never knew what I was going to walk into after, face, you know, dealing with the gun. So that day I came home, and I noticed that he was pacing the house, and... He was a different person, and he, you could tell he was frustrated and angry. But he really wasn't saying much other than pick, trying to pick a fight. And I and I don't I don't fight. I don't argue. So he wasn't able to do so, which just frustrated him even more. And so I just continued to observe him pacing, and I didn't see a gun in his hand, but I noticed that there was something heavy in his pocket, in his pants pocket. And sure enough, I realized it was a gun. So when I realized that, and he went to the back of the house, I ran out the side door and jumped in my SUV. I started it up, and then he came outside and started to beat on the window with the gun. And he said, roll the window down, roll the window down. He said, if you take off, I'm going to shoot. So at that point, you know, I risked going down the hill, having an accident, and him shooting me. I risk, it, I risk you know, pulling off and him shooting me as well. So I figured I could talk him out of it. And I was able to calm him down, and he sat down and ended up sitting there crying, I'm sorry, I won't do it anymore. And that was the last situation of the gun. But we did have instances where we argued, and he still had, you know, the erratic behavior, but just no other, no kind of weapons, no, he never hit me or anything like that. So when did the relationship so, officially end? So the, the relationship officially ended on his birthday in June of 2013. I think it was either June the 3rd or June the 6th, one of the two. And the reason why, um, the, reason why the relationship ended was because I had told him not to call me out of my name anymore because I found it very um, offensive and very disrespectful for someone especially that you love. And he did that that night because he became intoxicated and um, and I told him that it was I was done, it was over. So we went to his brother's house and we told him what was going on and we actually broke up inside the home and he put the keys on the couch and I grabbed the keys and I said, okay, well, I'm leaving. And he was like, yeah, let's go home. And I said, no, I, I really meant what I, what I said you'll never go anywhere with me ever again. And so as I went to walk out the door, next thing I knew, I'm laying on the grass and he's kicking me in my back. He had pulled my hair and I'm screaming, someone call 911. So his brother was able to get him off of me. Uh, me and the sister-in-law got in a car and he started beating on the windshield and cracked it. We left the scene. Um, we, so that we could check myself over. She's a nurse, and, um, you know, I didn't know what type of physical harm or injury I had, if I had any, and um, she, you know, wanted to make sure I was okay. So in the meantime, he's calling back, and he's like, well, I'm on man of war, and I'm going to the house. And he's like, just let me sleep in the basement, and he, at this time, he didn't realize what he had done. And so I called 911. They met at the house and um, they arrested him and like I said this was either June 3rd or June 6th something like that 
And so during this time where the relationship ended, you know, I gave him everything he had. I actually gave everything to his brothers and everything. And I figured I would have peace of mind, you know, and he still had everything that, you know, he could he could need to be on his own. Well, I guess time continued and he realized he lost a good thing and he lost his home. So I guess he became frustrated. He probably, I don't know, may have gone into more substance abuse or something. And on August the 9th of 2013, he hunted me down inside of a public um, location and he shot me five times. Wow. Yes. Well, obviously, um, you know, nothing prepares you for that. And I know, obviously, you first saw him uh, when we had talked earlier. Uh, you kind of sensed something wasn't right when you saw him that night, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yes, because actually the place that I was in, um, they said as long as I was in there, he couldn't come in. And if he was in there, they didn't want me to come in just to protect, you know, me and other parties inside the um, location. So I felt comfortable there, and for some reason, he came in that that afternoon, And but he didn't bother me. He actually sat with his back towards me, but what I failed to realize or even recognize was that with his back towards me, he was actually able to watch me in a mirror that was facing him, so he knew my every move that whole time, which, I mean, you're talking about a matter of maybe 15, 20 minutes, though. And when, when I did get up and go to the other side, he got up and followed me, and he came up behind me, and he was like, we need to talk, we need to talk, let's go outside, and I was like, no, I don't have anything to say, I'm over, this relationship, we're done. And um, next thing I know, he pulls his shirt up, and I saw the butt of a gun. And at that point, that's when God put up his shield and immediately started to protect me. Because when I saw the gun, I've, I've seen this on video. That's the only way I can um, recollect what, what happened. Um, I took a step, and I fell, and he stood over me, and he released the bullets while I was laying on the floor. Wow. So I never heard the gun. Yeah, I never heard the gun go off. I never felt a bullet go in me. Um, I recall waking up, and there was a white sheet over me. My ears were ringing. And I couldn't see, but I just kept saying, I got to get up. I got to get up. And after the third time I said that, I heard sirens. And then I said, I can't breathe. And I faded out. And little did I know till the next day, I had flatlined three times. Wow. Um, Let's stop right there because I'm... Unfortunately, we're almost out of time, and I want you to share more. But you just tuned in. We've been talking with April Ballantyne, and she's sharing her story about um, being shot five times by an ex-boyfriend. Obviously, miraculously, she is alive, but there's been some challenges and consequences to that night. But she has trusted God through all of this, and uh, she told me when we were preparing for this talk last week that uh, she has more peace than she's had. Uh, in a long, long time, and so you're going to be encouraged, you're going to be blessed as you hear somebody that what was meant for evil, when her ex-boyfriend shot her five times, uh, but she is alive, and uh, we're going to hear about how she recovered and how she's helping others through this awful situation that happened back in August of 2013. So tune in tomorrow as we continue our conversation with April Ballantyne on Hope Is Here. Need help selling your home? Are you looking to buy your dream home? Let Diana Fields and her team with the Millennium Real Estate Group at Keller Williams Bluegrass Realty help you. Serving Central Kentucky in real estate and property management for 21 years, Diana Fields and the Millennium team have the experience to help you with one of life's biggest decisions in buying or selling a home. Contact Diana Fields today at 859-621-0604 or online at MillenniumLex.com. That's MillenniumLex.com. Mom.